unleash Jesse and the Cincinnati Bengals have yet another primetime game on Sunday night in Baltimore against the Ravens. But first I've got to get to something that exploded on social media today, especially in Bengal land. Former quarterback Chris Sims went in on the Bengals. He is angry. He is frustrated. And he's frustrated about the Bengals' play calling. He is not a fan of the conservative, less creative play calling that we have been seeing so far through four games. And this is what he said. He said, this is just a small quote from, I think it was an eight minute segment that he did on his podcast. Um, he said it was a dis disservice to the talent on the football team and they are not given the advantages of other top quarterbacks and wide receivers in the league. And everybody is running the, the slant, the go route and that's just not going to get it done. And you know what? Chris Sims is right. That's not going to get it done. So then it had me thinking, you know, Zach Taylor has one of just 32 jobs in America right now. And that's the head coach of an NFL football team. You don't get to that spot in life by being dumb. Any smart football coach who sees the talent on this roster with the likes of Joe Burrow, Joe Mixon, uh, Tyler Boyd, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, another number one wide receiver anywhere else in the league. I mean, you look at that and as a coach, a smart one, I would think that you would think in your head, this is the type of talent who can execute on those creative style of plays that I've been itching to call maybe my whole career. So then I'm thinking, what's the issue here? Is it an insecurity in your own play calling? Is it your insecurity in the players being able to execute on that play that you really want to call? And maybe you're just not sure if they will execute on that. So you don't want to waste it and call it. And so I posed this question to one of my friends in the business, Hugh Jackson. We know him as a creative offensive mind. And so I just asked him, what, what is it? And he brought up a really good point. He said, you know, the head coach and the GM, in most cases, need to be on the same page with creative play calling. It's also on the assistant coaches to make sure that their position groups are on board with the creative play calling. And also the players have to be on board with the play calling. So then I'm thinking, you know what? It's it can't, it's not all on Zach Taylor and Brian Callahan. They're taking the majority of the heat. Yes, we would expect that because it is the head coach and the offensive coordinator of the Cincinnati Bengals. But it goes a lot deeper than that. It does involve the assistant coaches, the position coaches. It does involve the players. Do the players, current players on the roster, their talent is above most. But do they want to learn those plays? And do they feel confident in their ability to execute on those plays? There's a lot more that goes into just Zach Taylor being conservative and not being as creative as we would like to see with all of the talent that we're seeing on this roster. I am wondering if maybe we'll see more creative creativity on Sunday night because, again, they're playing for an, on a national stage. They have another national stage game, a Monday night game against the, the Cleveland Browns. It's a big deal to be able to showcase what you can do with the players on your roster. And look, I was, a lot of people know that I was, I don't know if you would call it um, down on Zach Taylor. I wouldn't say I was down on Zach Taylor, but I was critical. Sure. I was hearing some crazy, crazy stories coming out of that locker room. And there was a lot of criticism within the locker room of Zach Taylor. But personally, from my viewpoint, I think that he has grown into that role and he is doing a hell of a job right now. And um, the reason why I think that is because I've been able to go into the locker room and see the body language, see the demeanor of, of the players within the locker room. And it was most noticeable after their second loss. Usually you go in and you would expect the players to just be in bad moods. They're just, they're not into it. They don't want to talk to you. They're, they're over it. They're not, not into what's happening right there in that moment. And when I went in after their second loss to start the year, they were on the up. They seemed great. And that tells me that Zach Taylor does have a lot of buy-in within that locker room. So I, will we see more creative plays? I would expect so. 
it's they have to. I mean, every single team is doubling Jamar Chase. They put their second cornerback, their second best cornerback on Jamar Chase. They double him with the safety. And then they put their best corner on T. Higgins. Something's got to give. They've got to get more creative if they are going to blaze through the playoffs like they did last season. There are a lot of expectations on this team now. And we'll talk about the big expectation that we have on Sunday night against the Baltimore Ravens, a division foe. The AFC North is up for grabs. The Cincinnati Bengals must go into Baltimore and deal the Ravens their sixth straight loss at home. That is not an easy feat to pull off. But I pulled in um, Tim McGee, former Bengals wide receiver. He's played in the Super Bowl. You know him from 700 WLW as well. And the reason why I always bring him in, back when I worked in local news, we used to have a, a half hour sports show on Sunday nights and we would bring in guests. And I loved to bring in Tim McGee because of his raw, unfiltered way of speaking what everyone else had on their minds. He just didn't hold back. He still does not. And that's just something that I really appreciate. So I brought him in to speak about, you know, the Bengals trouble. He called it lack of run game so far this season. Um, Joe Mixon has not averaged more than three yards per carry so far this year. There's a lot of issues that need to be fixed. So um, Tim McGee and I dove into that. Here's that conversation. Tim, we're talking about the AFC North. It's up for grabs. Bengals are two and two. Ravens are also two and two. Um, I think the Bengals have a pretty good shot against the Ravens who have blown not one, but two 17 point leads so far in this very short season. It's um, it's rather surprising considering they have one of the best coaches in the national football league that is transpired. And like you said, not one, but two games in a row. And when, when you look at it, it's not just a meltdown. It's you could just tell from a chemistry standpoint within the, uh, within the players that, it's not something that they accept and they hold their coaching staff to a higher degree. And you saw the melee, if you will, verbal melee, if you will, <laughs> an argument, if you will, yes. uh, between Peters and, 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 and Harbaugh. So it's, it's just uncharacteristic of, of, of a team that's well coached, well trained, well disciplined to come out and just give two games away. But consequently, you know, you know, in the back of your mind that we we control those games. OK, we get, we just got to close the door. Uh, it's not major. Let's go back because, you know, we lost by 30 points or something like that. So, yes, disappointing from Baltimore to say the last, you know, but I still think they'll come back and I still think they're a great team. What does that say about their defense? I mean, for in week four, we're talking about Miami. And how Miami was giving the Bills almost 500 yards of total offense. They still win. They bend, don't break. But then the Ravens' defense certainly broke last week. It seemed like, you know, you have a 17-point lead and you lose by that. I mean, you lose by a small margin, but you continue to let the Bills score. What kind of state do you think that they're in right now? What are they? What's going through their heads? Would you Would you imagine? Doubtful. Why are we not closing out fourth quarter? Why? Yeah. That's you know they talk about sixty minutes in every single sport. They talk about oh you know you got to finish the game. You got to finish the game. And in their case, this is you know a typical example of not finishing games. So they have to go out and finish. And it's not. This is a easier said than done scenario because it's it's not like they're getting themselves in holes and they're blowing coverages of things of that nature. Here's the problem. And, and, and I really believe this is the problem. When you have big leads, defensive coordinators, they go by this script and they start backing off. So what got you there, No, they're no longer going to continue to execute. They're going okay. to go into that, what I call the prevent, prevent, prevent defense with prevent you to, from winning the game is the bottom line. So instead of continuing to be, say, not so aggressive, but nevertheless, they'll run in your base. They try these things and they, they go, you know, you call, some people call it bend, not break. What it is, is okay, we're going to play the clock, keep everything in front of you. They're going to get some first down. We're going to, once the field getting shortened, we're going to tighten things up because they won't have many lanes and more opportunity as far as the grounds to cover. It doesn't work. It, it's proven. It just doesn't work. But for some reason, they continue to try it. So they got what they deserve. What did you think? Because I know Harbaugh made that decision not to kick the field goal and to go for it on fourth down. 
offense was not click. I don't think they scored a touchdown since the second quarter. There were a few minutes left in the second quarter when they last scored a touchdown in that game against the Bills. He decides to go for it. Lamar Jackson throws an interception, which is quite possibly the worst scenario for them. <laughs> um, what did you think about that play call? Because he he was criticized everywhere for making for not taking the points in that situation. See, I I I can see both sides of it. You yeah. have a struggling offense, true enough, and you want to do something to bolster their confidence. Just let's just face it. So if you can get this first down and you know, when it doesn't work out, of course, we know how that goes. Everyone questions yeah. you. Everyone says that was the dumbest call in the history of man, which pretty much happens like 16 <laughs> times a week. But yeah. you know, your armchair quarterbacks are going to say, why didn't you take the points? You know, if you look at the Bengals game against Miami when um, Zach Taylor didn't take the points, trust me. Mm -hmm. At least that was the first time I had attended a football game where I set out in the stands mm -hmm. because they had the ring of honor and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the coaches around me, I mean, all 60,000 of them said, oh, my God, that was the worst thing to do. You should have taken the points. You're going to lose the game because of this. You know, whine, 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 whine. You know, it's like, okay, everyone can sit here and make a decision from afar. So, yes, it didn't work out for them. But, you know, at some point in time, you got to test your, your, your the guys in the locker room. You got to test the guys on the field. These are your guys. You got to have confidence in them that they can get it done. If you, if they don't, okay, fine. He didn't throw them under the bus. So I don't think people should really throw him under the bus. The Bengals swept Baltimore last year. That was the first time since 2015. Um, and granted, towards the end of the year when they played them, Baltimore had a slew of players out um, and injured. And it seems like now they have health on their side, which you've you've preached this for in the decade I've decade I've known you. You've always said health is wealth. You're gonna win as long as you are healthy and your key players are healthy. How do you think that they will fare, especially knowing that these two teams have faced each other so much? They know each other's calls and tendencies. They're very familiar with each other. Um, how do you, what do you think they're going to bring on Sunday night? It's another primetime game for the Cincinnati Bengals and all eyes are going to be on this game. Well, I, I tell you last year's game, the Bengals beat some players in the Baltimore Ravens uniforms. They didn't beat the Baltimore Ravens. They didn't beat their roster, but they did, they did what they had to do. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't their fault that they were decimated with injuries and COVID and, 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 and lots of other things. So this, this year it's, it's, it's going to be, kind of a get-back game, revengeful game. Uh, you know, I remember hearing the comments from Bart Scott uh, yes. on, on whatever whatever network he, he's on. And, you know, again, they are angered. It's kind of like, how dare you beat us twice? And you're taking yeah. advantage of our little brothers that, that was in that uniform. So uh, I don't think you need added incentives to play the game, number one. But in this particular case, if I'm a Baltimore Ravens player – you know, that's coming back and saw what happened last year and knowing you could, it's, it's hard. You're chomping at the bits. You're sitting on the sideline and you're watching it from home. You're going, Oh my God, I just wish I was out there. And now, you know, that year has passed where you're going to be able to get out there or the Baltimore Ravens are going to be able to get out, get out there and, and kind of reprove themselves or reestablish themselves as the champions of the AFC North and because that's their mindset and we all know it. Yeah. Their mindset is we are always going to finish one, two, plain and simple. And what happened last year was just not us. So they're out to prove themselves again. And, you know, they don't have a disadvantage. They're two and two, just like the Bengals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The AFC North is up for grabs. And I, I specifically remember that rant that Bart Scott went on because I remember him saying that the Bengals had earned themselves a lifetime of ass kicking after yeah, yeah, winning that yeah. final game. And then he kept talking about a red dot and how Joe Burrow had a red dot on him and something about the Ravens culture and stuff like that. I, I think Bengals fans at the time were kind of worried about Joe Burrow's, you know, health going into the next Ravens game because of that, that rant that we saw. Well, you know what? You have to understand his competitive spirit and their yeah. competitive spirit. What they were saying is, and we are, you got us on my worst day and not just my worst day. I can't even be out there to help him. And you can just tell it was grinding, you know, his eyes. You could tell, I mean, he was, was just mad. like, going, it's like, dude, 
you know, take a chill pill. Okay, we understand. We understand the team that was out there wasn't your starters. It wasn't even your third team. Yes, we get that. And they, the Bengals handled them pretty well. But it was a lot of jealousy in that, and it was a lot of hatred in that, that the fact that we lost to someone. And remember something, the last – Bart Scott probably have never seen the Bengals even formidable where they can compete with the Baltimore Ravens, let alone beat them and, wow, beat them twice. So it was a setback for them. And, and yes, they're going to have an extra off – an extra motivation to reestablish themselves. Yeah, I would I would expect because of that, I would expect Sunday night's game to be a little chippier, a little more physical than the, the previous four games that we've seen the Bengals play in so far this year. I, I think that, though, with every AFC North game that we see. Yeah, they just beat the hell out of each other. I mean, it's a <laughs> That's very crazy conference. That's what happens. If you ever want to gauge the AFC North, Look at the injury reports after they play one another. That yes. should give you an idea. It's like when the Bengals played the Steelers, you know, Najee Harris was out. T.J. Watt was out. There was just a slew of players that's out. So who has the advantage? The teams that play them after. You know, whoever you're going to play after that, they're like, well, you know, they're going to be down with 20% of their players. So, you know, it's just a matter of who. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal every single game. Um, and – I wanted to ask you specifically because you were a receiver in the NFL, Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow. So Jamar was targeted against the Dolphins six times. He had four catches, 81 yards. That is a drop off, obviously, from the previous year. What does what is going through his head, do you think? I mean, he's having to be more patient than maybe he was expecting as far as, you know, his own stats and his own numbers are concerned. But one thing that I will say that I've noticed about him is that he has, he doesn't seem to have a diva complex about him. He doesn't really seem to have much of an ego, which is great as far as having to be patient. Um, but what, what do you think? What, how do they, how do they get this going for Jamar? How do they get him more involved? Because I remember during that Thursday night game, Jamar had, I believe, a catch in the first quarter. And then we, James and I were talking, we hadn't seen him catch another ball for a, a, at least a quarter, maybe two. Well, I, I, I said this, and I know many people have uh, kind of mimicked my words. The key to the Bengals in, in slowing down their offense is real simple. If you have a cover corner guy, a guy that can cover one-on-one, -on -one, Mm -hmm. The average person thinks, or even the above average person, which I'm probably somewhere around the below average person, but I do have a football mind. I put you up. <laughs> we disagree on that. There are a few <laughs> things we disagree on. We'll disagree on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, they think you're going to take your number one guy and put it on your opponent's number one receiver. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. That's not what you're going to do. What you're going to do is take your cover guy and you're going to put him on T. Higgins. You're going to take two guys, your corner and your safety, and you're going to play Jamar Chase inside out or over the top. But what you're going to do is you're going to make Joe Burrow throw him slants, quick outs, out. He's not going to hurt you. That's their plan. He is not going to hurt us with the impact chunk plays. And for four games, they've pretty much been very successful. I know he caught a deep one the other day, but that was what happened. That was a byproduct of Mr. T. Higgins beating the one-on-one. -on -one. Then Xavier Howard went out the game. Now you don't mm -hmm. have that cover guy, so that's going to loosen things up. As far as Jamar's patience, get used to it. Every <laughs> single person, every single defensive coordinator is going to play you that way. You right. are too dynamic. It is a compliment. It's a compliment to your skill set, your physical abilities, to your, 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 your quarterback and your coaching staff that they know it starts with you. It doesn't start with any other player on the, uh, on the football field. Now, who's the key to their offense? That would be Joe Mixon. Yeah. That's the key to your offense. So basically, defense are saying, listen, we have to pick a poison because the Bengals have talent everywhere, and even at tight end now. Mm -hmm. who, are we going to, who are we going to say if they win, they win? So who are we going to select right now? It's not T Higgins. It's basically Joe Mixon. They're saying, if you can run the ball, you're going to be successful because we have, we're taking three of our players 
and we're putting it on two of your best players. If you can run inside, you're going to win. But unfortunately, they haven't been able to do that. We're talking about the offense. We're not talking about overall right. wins and losses of the ball game. That's how you suppress, control, and neutralize the Bengals' high-powered offense. And I think any offense who has an, an established run game is much more efficient um, than obviously an offense who doesn't have an established run game. And um, after the Thursday night game, we had a loyal viewer ask me, his name is Tom, asked me what I thought was wrong with the run game. And my thing was, and tell me if I'm off on this theory. This is just one of my theories that I've concocted. Frank Pollock, Joe Mixon have worked together before. They've worked together for a while. Joe Mixon made it public that he was upset when Frank Pollock left when Zach Taylor was hired. And obviously Frank Pollock didn't know if he was going to be retained. So I don't blame him for leaving. He was also upset when his running backs coach, Kyle Kasky, was let go. But he was more upset, it seemed like to me, about Frank Pollock. So then Frank Pollock comes back. And offensive linemen at the time, three, four years ago, were telling me that <clears throat> Mixon liked Frank Pollock so much because Pollock spent so much time with him explaining him when to hit certain holes, um, when certain holes were going to be available for him, and when to anticipate that. And the only thing that has changed is the offensive line, the men on the offensive line. So my, my theory was that maybe Joe Mixon has to get used to the tendencies of the men on the offensive line in order to be more successful. And that's what I said to Tom on Friday and Mixon on Monday told the media, I wasn't there, but he told the media that he had a meeting with the offensive linemen. There were about 10 people in the, in the meeting and they were just having a discussion about what he expects on certain plays, what they should expect of him on certain plays. And it seemed like they were kind of trying to get on the same page. And I'm wondering if maybe my theory is correct, but you can totally debunk me if you think I'm wrong. <laughs> well, put it this way. First of all, there is no run game. Let's, let's, no. Just, let's be honest. Secondly, it doesn't matter what st strategy or system you're trying to operate. They're getting beat by the guys in a different color uniform. So it doesn't matter what Frank Pollard, Tim McGee, or anyone else teaches them what to do. <laughs> you have to win the blocking war. And right yeah. now, the, the line of scrimmage is, is dis well, they're disallowing Joe Mixon to have success because it's not there. There's only one running back that I can think of in, the NF in NFL history that was able to have a Hall of Fame career without a offensive line, and that was Barry Sanders. Yep. So Joe Mixon is not Barry Sanders, and he's going to need opportunities. Opportunities is touches. They're touches. Mm -hmm. Then their opportunities are holes. You have to have that. It's not like the other team. And, and I get so frustrated in my analysis of, of the game is – when people just think, oh, well, if they only did this, well, guess what? There's professionals on the other side, right. and they, they are winning the battle. And just like when the Bengals played against the Miami Dolphins, don't you think their fan base was saying, all we should have done, all we could have done, we should have, if we would have done, no, you got out-executed. And that's <laughs> what's happening on the offensive line. I'm not picking on the line. Because I think they're they've gotten from the first game to the last game. I think they they're getting better. Yeah, but pass saying, blocking is great. What people are asking them to do is be great pass blockers and great run blockers from day one when they've never played with each other. They this is the first time they probably barely know each other's name. There's no <laughs> continuity there. So yes, it's going to take them time to gel. And unfortunately, like as we were talking about Jamar Chase and Joe Mixon they're going to have to show patience and more more than patience, understanding of why and when that happens, how things can be turned around. And, you know, the Bengals have offensively, they're a pass first, run second. And now they're figuring, other teams have figured out and they're going, we don't have to stack the box. We're, we're winning the one-on-one -on -one battles. That's scary. And that has to be scary to, you know, Zach Taylor and, you know, Bill Callahan. Well, in, in our first interview for my very first episode of the OT, we were talking about, or you specifically were talking about managing expectations for the season. I want to know what are the expectations for a team? I mean, week one, they had so many issues to correct, especially for the offensive line. It seems like they have made corrections. They've gotten better in certain areas like pass blocking. 
But how many issues can we expect them to correct and correct well to a point where they execute it in live NFL action in one week? That's that's my point. It's like, okay, <laughs> hey, let's just go and practice and we're going to come out on Sunday and we're going to beat the other team. Well, you know what? TJ Watts ate them alive. You know, yeah. Dallas whole defense ate them alive. And the Jets don't have the same – the Jets didn't have the same defense, neither did the Miami Dolphins. So they stepped up to the plate. There's no – they've gotten better. But you're asking too much. You're asking mm -hmm. them to fix everything. Here's what's going to happen, people. This AFC North is going to be a grind. Yeah. It's going to be – It a, is every year. Yes. It's going to be a 9-7 and seven, Going into the last game, the, all the implications if this team wins or this team wins, who's going to win the division? Who's Okay, I understand it was a glory year last year. Super Bowl, everything went with the Bengals' way. The ball hit the upright, went in for them, out for the other team. Ball tipped, the Bengals grab it. That's the way it went. Lower your expectations. That crap ain't happening this year. It doesn't happen every year. It, does, it just doesn't. The one thing the Bengals are not getting, they're not getting the breaks that people have felt that they're entitled to. Yeah. They're making some breaks. And, you know, I, I, I think Coach Lou is not – I think their defense is doing a hell of a job. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean they're carrying the team at this point, I would Coach say. Lou they haven't the most un underrated, unappreciated coordinator in the National Football League. What he's done – and you know I was a not big, humongous skyscraper critic – of his defense, not him personally, of his defense. He got his personnel in there and show, see what you can do in my system. Yeah. He's underrated, undervalued, and they have been the glue that has kept that team in every single game. Yeah, they were getting criticism in the first two games for not having enough takeaways. But then when you watch them against the Jets, you watch them against the Dolphins. I mean, they were coming up with those big splash plays. I mean, they are certainly doing their job. Getting Take their away. shot. <laughs> I'm like, how they're on the field like 80% of the time because <laughs> the offense was giving away. <laughs> it's like the offense was interception, interception, fumble, interception. Well, I mean, you're not going to get many takeaways in the red zone. So, you know, again, right. now I, I don't want to break the team apart. I'm just saying the defense, I'm an offense guy. You know that. Yeah. But the defense right now is carrying that team. There's no question about it. Well, and I wanted to ask you, go back to the run game just for a second. Um, because I game? thought, huh? What run game are we talking about? Well, the the potential run game. Oh, okay. We'll okay. go to potentials now. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a really interesting segment on NFL Live where they were talking about um, when a quarterback is under center, how much harder that is to defend from a defender's point of view, because you brought up the defenders and how the other team, the other, the opponent is really making it tough for them to get a run game going. So under center, it's much tougher for a defense to read exactly what you're going to do. But when a, when a quarterback is in shotgun, they can relax a little bit. They can anticipate a little bit more, which allows them to play better and execute defensively what they need to do in order to stop the offense from doing what it needs to do. And Mina Kime specifically brought in these stats, and I thought they were really interesting. I'll read them off to you. She said that Joe Burrow was under center week one, only 3.8%. That increased week two to 16.7, week three, 22.8, and last week, the highest, 25.8% of the time he was under center. Does that help as far as – execution on offense obviously it's helped the pass game but does that help the run game especially if if you know that you're able to set a play from the beginning where a run and a pass might look the same yeah well here, here's what happened and when these coaches came in these young coaches three four years ago they started this run pass option and in mm -hmm. order to execute that you had to be in what's you know called the shotgun or you know, whatever, whatever you want to label it as being. Well, one thing, if you know, if you've been around the NFL, you, you know, defensive coaches will catch up with the offense. It's going to happen. You got to, the window of opportunity is maybe a year, just like we're looking at the Bengals right now where they were explosive. Now, you know, they're manageable from a defensive standpoint. So 
what has happened is now the, the, the defensive personnel are teaching the defense, the players to watch the ball. You know, where before you had lanes, you were rushing upfield and you were playing the run after going after the pass or vice versa. Well, I, I couldn't agree 100 percent. I couldn't agree more with the fact that if you're never under center, you know, it's like, OK, well, thanks for showing me what you're what you're going to do. But again, if you go back, reflect back last year, they made a lot of reverses out of it. You know, they, they pitched the ball to the running back, misdirections. OK, there there's a. A lot of things that you can really do from that particular formation, if you will. However, not being under the center eliminates so many things. And that's what it is. It's giving the defense advantage because it eliminates what you can't do more so than what you can do. I know what you can do when I'm sitting here watching the football. I see it. You know, it's not every day you like walk around with a football. So it's a strange object. <laughs> so I, I but. What analytics have done, the Bengals have, in, in, in my very strong opinion, they've scouted themselves. And yeah. that's why you see the increase that you see. Oh, you know, it was only around 3.8% of the time that Burrow was under, under the center. Trust me, I probably washed my house on a greater percentage of the, than that. So, yeah, they, they saw it, recognized it, and made adjustments that defense are keying on that. So, and that's. That's what, as a former NFL player, that's what I look at. I love the chess matches. I love yes. move, counter move, move, counter move. That's what the analytics does for me. They don't give game day advantages. They just tell you what the trends are. That's bottom line. And I've got one more question for you. How do you think the Bengals will do in their second prime time? That's what, two of, they have another one on Monday night against the Browns later on this month. Um, how do you think they will fare? And what does it say about a team? If they are able to pull out this win, you start out 0 and 2, you finish week five, three and two, three straight wins. I'd say that w they should be pretty confident in themselves, right? You know what? It, that is probably that's an awesome question because when you think about it, they lost two games that they probably should have won on paper. Yeah, And they've won two games that they should have won on paper, but so has their rivals. Their rivals are facing the same thing. So I think right. you look at the Bengals, if you look at the Ravens, and, and of course the Cleveland Browns, not the Steelers, because they just absolutely stink. <laughs> if you look at the other three teams, they're probably looking at the ones that got away. And who are we? I mean, are we this team? Are we this team? Are, are the Bengals on a roll because when you look at it, they're not just blowing teams out. They're not dominating anyone, but they're playing good enough to win. And that's why I went back early in, the, in, in our conversation. I said, this is a grind. And yeah. no matter how well you do or don't do, next week is going to be a grind. And the week after that is going. And then what you're going to do or players going to do, fans going to do, we as media, we're going to do, we're, we're going to see like who one who lost when we're watching the game you're like you're looking up you're like what are the ravens doing he's like oh they're winning and then you go wait a minute how did they lose that game you know <laughs> the cleveland browns beating the jets by 14 points and what you look up there you go they lost yeah that happened so you are not just watching people you're not just going to be able to sit back and watch your team you're going to have to watch two other teams in the afc north the cleveland browns and the baltimore ravens and it's going to be a grind. It's just not. And don't get down on the team if they lose the one, two or three games or whatever. Don't get down on it. That's just that's what you should expect now. Yeah, it's it's I I know fans were really down on the team after an 0 2 start. And I think that was because it, the analytics said that you only had a 12 percent chance of making the playoffs. So I think that's why they were pretty upset at that point. But they should be happy with the I would think with the improvements that they have been seeing from this team and the corrections that they have been making. They yes. still have a lot more to do, but from where I'm sitting, I still think that they have a valid chance of making the playoffs. One thing that Tim and I did not have a chance to dive into in that near 40 minute conversation, I swear to God, I can listen to Tim talk for hours and it feels like five minutes to me. I don't know if you're the same. Let me know <laughs> if those conversations are just too long for you. They're never too long for me. 
that's just the way I am. Um, but we didn't get to talk about the turnover battle and how significant that is, especially in regards to this specific series. In this series, the team who wins that turnover battle between the Bengals and the Ravens is 35 and six. The Bengals absolutely must take care of the football on Sunday night, Sunday night football, big prime time game. We want to see more creativity. We want to see them take care of the football. We want to see the Cincinnati Bengals run that ball down the Ravens throat. Will we see it? Who knows, but we can only hope. I'll see you next week right here on the OT at eight o'clock.